Starbucks China has experienced incredible growth. Starbucks has successfully realized that the Chinese consumer is different to its traditional Western consumer, and it's exploited those differences to build a service that adds real value. However, if Starbucks continues with its current plans to expand its number of stores, it will dilute its brand and not hit its revenue targets. Today and after, how can Starbucks China increase its revenue growth by 70% within the next three years? You propose that you open 1,400 additional stores over these three years. However, our solution sees you open up zero additional stores and still be able to reach this growth target. There are two strategies which sees you launching a new mobile distribution platform as well as ensuring the desirability of your Starbucks brand. Let's take a look at some of the consumption trends between your Chinese consumer and your Western consumer. In China, the average consumer consumes around four cups of coffee per year, whereas compared to the US, this is around 50 cups. We see this as huge growth potential for your Starbucks brand. There comes a point in the growth of Starbucks in any market where there are so many stores that people's perception changes from Starbucks as a premium brand that they want to support to a big corporate that they want to actively not support. This has happened in the US with the movement for people to want to go to independent coffee stores instead of supporting Starbucks. This hasn't yet happened in China and it's crucial that you do not reach the point where that happens because when it does, it means that by building a new store, you do not get the same return that you would before you reach that point. Your current model has seen you combine licensing stores with building out your own stores. With a licensed store model, you can build stores faster because it requires a lesser amount of capital. However, you have to share the profits and that means that you make less money from each one of those stores. When you use the licensing model to increase the pace at which you can bring on new stores online, what you do is you increase the store numbers by, and that makes your brand more accessible. The problem is that takes out your brand premium and given that most of those stores are earning you less profit already, you end up in a place where you hit yourself twice. Let's take a step back and look at the value proposition of Starbucks in the West and in China. In the West, it is what's in the cup that is most important to a consumer. So the taste of the coffee, as well as, what, um, as, well as having a quick coffee on the go before they go to work, and also offers an informal situation where they can catch up with friends. In China, however, it, the values transcend beyond the cup. People consume, cons consume Starbucks because it is affiliated with the Western brand, and that goes beyond this. People even host business meetings within Starbucks. Your consumers range between the ages of 18 and 42 years old. These can be mainly divided into three large groups. The first group comprises of college students, the second group comprises of young urban professionals, and the third comprises of mums and dads. We see the young urban professionals being the trend influencers of these three groups, as your college students aspire to this group, and your mums and dads aspire to be young and be like this group as well. We've noticed a few distinct characteristics of this group, being that they have extremely high disposable income, that they are mobile savvy, they are typically short on time, and they regularly attend business meetings. Therefore, our two strategies will later on target these characteristics specifically. A unique factor in the Chinese market and a critical problem for Starbucks is the mobile application Lion Coffee. Lion Coffee has grown fast to actually be, make up now 10% of your sales. This means that 10% of the Starbucks coffee sold in China are going through this app. This may seem good, but it's actually a critical problem. Whereas when a customer's in your store, you're the one with that relationship, you're the one at the narrowest part of the value chain where you can extract the maximum value, with Lion Coffee, they're the ones with the customer relationship. You are nothing more than a glorified supplier alongside every other coffee supplier that they're working with already. It gets worse. Lion Coffee have already decided to bring their own in-house brand into play and are actively trying to discount that to move customers from Starbucks to Lion Coffee. This means 
that the distribution channel that makes up 10% of your sales is actively trying to take away those sales. If you do not respond to this, you risk losing those sales and losing out on a new phenomenon of mobile coffee offering, ordering, which as you've seen in the US market, is becoming more and more important over time. In light of this, the first strategy that we'd like to present to you today is all about bringing your mobile platform online in China as soon as possible. You've already launched the service in the United States, but you need to have it in the Chinese market immediately. The Chinese market is different, and that means that you're going to need to not just have a native application, but have mobile web and WeChat available as channels as well. The goal of this is to move those customers that are using Lion Coffee onto your in-house service as soon as possible and begin to capture more customers as we see that trend moving more and more toward mobile coffee ordering. We propose you achieve this through a contract with Didi, which is the Chinese equivalent of Uber. This is because we want to rapidly acquire this distribution network. As you can see from the urgency of this problem, this needs to be done as soon as possible. We also want you to aggressively promote your mobile distribution platform in order to com combat Lion's current strategy. Our second strategy is all about ensuring that your brand stays premium and valuable even as you grow. It has two main parts. You, we want you to buy back licensed stores so that you can have control and get uh, greater profits from them. And introduce VIP areas to add value for your, great, for your uh, highest purchasing consumers. The rationale behind first needing to buy back your licensed stores is so you can increase the quality control on your product as well as enable your second strategy, being able to modify the physical stores itself. Now the modification of the physical stores by adding in the VIP lounge will enable you to create um, additional brand value to, your, to Starbucks. These VIP lounges will offer specialty drinks and this further targets your young urban professionals who may desire to ho hold um, business meetings in these venues. Going beyond the people who will actually use these lounges, this adds value to your brand by giving something that people aspire to and a reason why they see Starbucks as premium. This is crucial for ensuring that you don't get to a point where people are seeing Starbucks as a less valuable brand because it's too accessible. This has been an overview of our strategy and we're now going to pass you on to Noel and Jono to take you through the implementation and finance behind these strategies. Thank you, Maka and Emma. To recap, our two strategies are a mobile distribution platform to get control back from Lion Coffee and have them on our own platform and take care of deliveries that way, and to ensure desirability of the brand, since having too many Starbucks stores at every corner makes a Starbucks brand passe. So let's consider the first strategy of mobile platforms. You first need to create a mobile distribution platform. What this platform will offer is a free first coffee, and then an aggressive friend get friend referral program, which works as follows. A friend can get another friend onto our platform, and in return they get a free drink of their choice. After this, you need to first contract out Didi for deliveries of coffee. Didi will be working on a contract basis. How this works is, a customer orders through our platform, and we get Didi to take care of deliveries. They work on a contract basis, and they work mainly in tier one China cities with a densely populated urban population. Why Didi? This is because they have a large network, they have a trusted brand in China, and they provide more convenience to these customers in China. What if Didi says no to our deal? In this case, we need to take care of deliveries by ourselves to get it away from line coffee. What this means is we'll have to, this will be a slower approach, but we need to focus again in tier one cities in the more densely populated regions. And we need to provision for deliveries ourselves. This will include things such as having uh, employees that can drive and that can have a way to get the products to the customers when they require it. As mentioned, this specifically targets that group of young urban professionals because they're time poor and they, they appreciate the ability to get a coffee on the go. We think they have a disproportionately high consumption of coffee because of their greater so, uh, aspirations towards um, Western brands. So we think they make up about 40% of coffee consumption in China. Currently, because you're not catering to them, you're only getting about 20% of these. But by introducing our new offering through the DD platform, you'll be able to increase that to 35%. The other thing is, 
Because you're enabling them to have a more convenient coffee, we see that their consumption will increase. Because I mean, there's that time where they're really in a rush, and they don't have enough time to pop it to Starbucks, they can get one on the go as they take a, cap a taxi. So the consumption will increase slightly as well, we think, on the whole, by one cup of coffee per month. In total, for driving an additional 240 million in revenue over three years. To roll out this first strategy, we propose you do it on three special days in China. Chinese Valentine's Day, the regular Valentine's Day, and Singles Day. This can have further provisions to offer anonymous coffee from secret admirers. <laughs> now looking at our second strategy, about ensuring desirability. The first part of the strategy sees you buying back certain stores that are currently leased out. What you need to, what, the stores you need to target are mainly business-centered, since this strategy focuses on the VIP customers that spend a lot of money, namely the young professionals, and also stores that are underperforming, so we can get control of these stores and boost their revenues and actually take away the revenues that were currently given to the franchisee. We want to buy these back at a rate of 100 stores per year for the next three years. Now, there's a bit of a red herring in the case that the revenue from our licensed stores is only 9% of total revenue, because we note that looking at the, um, at the full um, income statement, they have a much higher margin, twice the, just over twice as much as the owner-operated stores because you're only flipping the ticket. However, even when accounting for this, your profit per store from your own stores is four times as much. And when we think about the long term as well, as Mike has talked about, where the number of stores is inversely related to the brand value of Starbucks in China, it's very important that you maximize profit per store. So, we'll be looking to buy back about 300 stores over these three years, and that will generate an additional 145 million based on the new share of revenue that you're taking compared to the license. The second part of this strategy sees you redecorating stores in these business areas to cater to these high, high, uh, young professional, high value customers. So, to redecorate these stores for these customers, you need to provide them with premium seating, de um, dedicated baristas to make their coffees, and also exclusive drinks that they can't get in other parts of the store. You also can offer loyalty schemes, such as a number of coffee for a certain period of time, and they can have unlimited access at this, at this time. So you can next market this to these young professionals. The ad features will again go through these three points we've listed before. The impact of this will be increasing the consumption of people who aspire to have these premium features so that they can bring their friends into the VIP lounges with them. We think that that's about 30% of the customer market um, knowing the fact that uh, the Chinese market has a preference to be able to show these things off. So this will in turn, by increasing the consumption from one cup a day, so one cup a week to two cups a week, as it's part of a loyalty program with a frequency of purchase unlocks these benefits, generate an additional 190 million in revenue in three years' time. In total then, our two strategies will lift your current revenue from 590 million to just under 1.2 billion, achieving a 97% revenue growth, which is greater than the target you've set up yourselves. Most importantly though, that comes with no new store increases but a profit per store increase of 75%, meaning into the future, you'll be better set up to retain the premium Western association of values with your brand. Thank you, that was the finance and implementation of our strategy. I'd like to now pass back to Micah and Emma to conclude. Today you have asked us, how can Starbucks China increase its revenue by 70% over the next three years? We propose you can achieve this revenue target without opening any additional new stores through our two strategies by launching a mobile distribution platform as well as ensuring the desirability of your brand by introducing premium features. If you follow your current strategy, three years from now, you'll have flooded the market, you'll have got to that point that you are at in the US where customers actively avoid Starbucks because it's everywhere and they're just done with it. Following our strategy, you'll achieve even greater revenue while adding value in order to put yourself in a place to succeed in the future. This has been our presentation, and we'll now invite questions from the floor. <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll start off first. So you're, you're talking about um, using the mobile distribution platforms as one of your, your key strategies. But don't you think that by the, the cost of coffee in China is quite high compared to what you can do for just a cup of coffee in the US. 
But then, do you think that people would really go and buy a very high value coffee for just a quick, uh, a quick drink? Because the point is, the, the, the it's about the culture. It's about going to the mm. store. So how can people then see this value of having a quick drink with that amount of values? We mainly affiliated this strategy um, with your young urban professionals who typically order a coffee um, to take to work. So if you can see the Starbucks packaging on the cups themselves and get that delivered to your company, it still shows your Western brand affiliation without you needing to enjoy going to the store and purchase it yourself. Chris, um, a couple of things. So in their original um, you know, success factors, one of the things was around um, really sort of different thinking, right? Now, I understand China is, has gone and is going through a technological revolution and leapfrog, and that this, this is more to me a survival kind of method. I mean, without it, you will die, basically. But it's a very me too kind of an idea. It's not really an original differentiated thinking idea that made Starbucks successful in the first place. So how do you feel about that? And how would you take something as blase as a mobile distribution platform, which is something you have to do to compete in today's world, and turn it into a real competitive advantage? Look, I completely agree that it is a fast follow strategy. You're simply doing the same thing that a competitor is doing. You've got to do it, because if you don't, your competitor is just going to take all of those people away from you. So there's no question about whether Starbucks needs to do that. We think that a creative way that Starbucks can be different is with its aggressive promotion strategy and its way to integrate it into Chinese culture with launching all those special days with special promotion methods. You are going to be doing the same thing, but with creative, aggressive promotion, you can still do it. On the, on the, the identification of the own versus the license uh, issue, um, I mean, even when we thought to what the cost of that would be, yeah. yeah, so based on the, the revenue that we're trading from them, I did look at a multiplier of about um, 10 times, and that would give us to a total cost of um, 700 million to acquire all the all the stores. We know that Starbucks has over um, a billion in cash at the bank at the moment, mm -hmm. and by rolling out less stores, we'll be saving on capital expenditure on those. So they are comparable strategies. And do you see, I'm, I'm just sort of stuck in the middle, do you see coffee being consumed in the coffee shops anymore, or do you see it being mobile, using DD Taxi or Grab Buy? How, how, where do you see that? We absolutely think it's still going to be a, a both. So depending on what, what kind of situation the customer's in, in China we absolutely recognise that um, there is a, a real, um, it, yeah, people do enjoy going into the Starbucks stores and sitting down for time, having business meetings and drinking the coffee. There's also a growing middle class of professionals that are time poor and they need to be able to get their coffee on the go. So that's why we've looked at how we can target both of those. There is a, a financial cost to uh, buying back the stores. But there's also a larger, possibly a reputational or uh, you know, a, a cost of kind of breaking those partnerships and possibly some of the trust and credibility that you've managed to attain as a, as a so how would you mitigate that risk? Uh, for this, actually, we're looking at the underperforming stores first. And we think that there's quite a few underperforming stores because their revenues are lower than the stores that we own. So we're going to target these groups first and see that we can get them under our control before we look at people that are successful instead of aggressively taking it over. We think that those people will be more likely to give um, re re release control of their stores because they have an underperforming store. If they are already underperforming, and you're buying it, so definitely there is something wrong with it. The, 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 the location is not the right place, but you're still putting a lot of money to invest in those companies. So how much of the buffer you have to take away in terms of the profitability in order to get to the numbers? Because you're not assuming that once you take over, you're going to get the right, the same amount of profitability. Well, the thing is that by taking over, we will have be able to obtain control of this, which means we'll be able to ensure that the, um, you know, the store layout and the, the way that the brand is communicated with the furniture and with, with the decorations is the same as all of our other stores, which we think will be able to lift their performance up, especially with introducing new things such as the VIP lounge. Um, yes. Um, on the 
on your, on your segmentation, I think it's interesting point, so you be happy that I understand concept. Where are you going to draw the line? Like, what, what are you going to provide? So the idea is to make it more conducive to having business meetings in this area or having a talk that is not clouded by other, say, younger people having their own discussions and having a loud laugh. It can cater more to these people when they're trying to have a proper meeting. So it's uh, things like, you know, um, drinks that are more suitable for this thing, things that require music and an environment where they can talk more Any thoughts about the political tension between the US and China? Because Starbucks is a US brand. So is there something wrong with the two relationships? So what do you think is the thing that you need to do to defend that brand? But there are geopolit geopolitical factors that have influenced the relationship between those countries and do have an impact on any company trying to operate in the other. We don't think that there's anything you can do in the way that you operate on the ground that actually is going to impact that. If there are events that happen in the future, it would be beneficial for you to have government relationships, but it's our understanding you've already, you've already developed a lot of that. At the end of the day, we didn't think that the most important problem for Starbucks right now is actually any of those sort of broader trends, and that the best thing you can do is compete now and to uh, ride what happens with that. Considering the size of population of China, um, would there not be any possibility of uh, physical expansion at all? I mean, you kind of have a, an all and nothing type strategy. Did you consider maybe expanding a little? In the short run, we think your focus should not be expanding um, the amount of physical stores you have, but improving the quality and ensuring consistency among your existing stores. In the long run, however, we do not object to the fact that you can expand and have more stores. You didn't uh, mention anything about the product reach. So, anything on your product expansion? So, perhaps if the store is the same number, but how about the, the product is available for customers? We looked at your existing product mix, which is a range of, say, um, you know, products that cater more to the Chinese market, so it's a variety of teas, as well as your home based coffee market. And we thought that's actually really important to include the phone, because often uh, a way to get people into the Starbucks stores for the first time is to try and, you know, um, products they're familiar with local teas, and then you might be able to come down because you try and get some new some of your coffees. So that's why we think we should retain your existing approach. In terms of introducing new features, this is going to be introduced to our VIP lounges, um, offering specialty drinks, maybe alcoholic drinks, to your business meetings, and have a special barista making these drinks. say is that if you do take a more innovative strategy and try and do something for the first time, that isn't in itself necessarily a box your competitors simply doing the same thing. The way, the way you build out your stores uh, for competitors to copy and any sort of similar innovations are also going to be able to be copied easily. Um, looking broadly at the reason our strategy is going to where you can continue, we think that to, uh, if you can simply hold on to that Western brand, it does add enough that you will continue to compete against those local Chinese companies. But you have less cost um, other brands that cost coffee Absolutely. So cost represents that 25% of my market share from what I recall. And then Starbucks has a market share much larger than this. Now if we couple first mover advantage with our current existing market share, we think the influence of our stores could be much stronger than what Costa has if they follow our strategy in a year or two years' time. And also, we see that Chinese consumers appreciate innovation. Um, if they get accustomed to going to, to associating Starbucks with your VIP stores, they may no longer, they may be less accepting of Costa's um, premium lounges. I just want to jump back to the no new stores point that you raised. 
just thinking, so one of the original success factors was about being the first mover. And they were saying, we don't want to expand into any more cities. We were concerned that competitors, particularly the branding side, will, will get there first and basically use what we did first to beat us to the competition. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I'd say firstly, we have around 2,000 stores in China already, so we think we have reason to be encouraged. The store expansion would more be to um, you know, augment some of our existing stores in the same regions. On that point, we did, again, we, we definitely don't rule out store expansions in the long run, but our immediate term strategy should be ensuring that we don't lose that premium that people can associate with the Starbucks brand, so we consolidate you know, our existing stores to ensure they're similar, and we offer a feature that uh, results in people see, um, seeing an exclusive, you know, exclusive aspect of Starbucks that our competitors don't have. After that, we definitely think you should continue rolling out stores in new regions to capture in the growing uh, demand for coffee in China. delivery system where you can just have your own scooter to a car and people take the coffee over. This is going to be much slower, but this is still necessary to have it away from Lime Coffee's current um, acquisition because they plan to, as, as is mentioned the case, have their own distribution systems and this is they have the relationship with the customer which is the distributor. So we need to have it that we can give to the customers straight away. How, how would it actually work? I mean, excuse my ignorance. But how, so I order a coffee and it gets delivered. It's not going to be cold, like practically speaking. Have we thought about taking a mobile unit into the major league popular areas or what you use? The reason why we suggested to roll up if we had to do it the conventional method and not be able to target all of China at the same time is that we start with the most populated and most dense areas. This is to prevent your coffee from getting cold because we imagine there will be maybe three people within a close proximity of each other ordering coffee at the same time so that we can get it to their still hot. With the anti trend, anti chain trend, that you're describing. The anti, anti, anti chain trend that's going on in China around the world about not liking the chain store. Is there any impact to what you're doing? I think that was a core in terms of our strategy, right? Because we didn't want to continue growing our stores and expansion, right? So we're seeing as, you know, the shop that's at every corner where it's so accessible, we can't be seen as. So great job. Really enjoyed listening to you and thanks for fielding our questions. Um, one thing I do want to ask you more just a little bit away from this the stressful questions you've been getting is uh, you are I guess millennials yourself. Um, so I just wonder what is your own view on this whole idea of a company like Starbucks that really has so much wealth of brand based on that experience um, and, and them trying to get super digital and become, you know, ultra human and <clears throat> become another Alibaba or whatever it is yeah. that they're trying to become. I mean, what's your own view? I'd really like to hear all your views, so. Okay. I don't actually think it's a critical impediment to Starbucks to do that. I think that they can roll out a digital strategy and frame themselves as an innovator that are trying to exist in that world. So I think that personally, if Starbucks did roll out a mobile platform that gave me some advantages compared to using a competitor, I probably actually would. Okay, me too. I definitely believe that um, digital and the physical human aspects can coexist. I'm probably slightly more um, leaning towards human factors because I'm quite slow to catch on to trends and digital stuff. But in the long run, um, once I get trained into it, I can definitely start and Personally, there was some method of like an Uber Eats type thing, but not necessarily where I could get the coffee delivered to where I, wherever I'm studying or working um, within a, a quick, a fast time and still hot. That would sell it for me. But I don't think I can see them in the same lights as you know, the lights of Alibaba, um, but I can definitely see them as similar to the way that Domo's innovating with its delivery systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.